Hello everyone, welcome to our interview with Gary Davis. He is the executive director of European Cleft Organization. He is very experienced on the projects across Europe to raise awareness. He has done so many projects. So we will talk about the projects he has done so far and we will discuss how can we promote face equality more. So Gerrit, a very warm welcome to our interview. I met you in London last year and I, I really admire what you, you have done so far. Uh, you are a really good example for us too. You have touched so many people and you raised awareness a lot. So as a Happy Faces Association, we are eager to collaborate with you too. Uh, so uh, what would you like to say about yourself? Could you uh, briefly talk about yourself? Please? Sure, yeah. Thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, I do remember uh, when we met um, in London um, it was a year ago now, yes. Um, and th thank you for your, <coughs> your kind words as well. <coughs> um, myself, yeah, I, I was born with a cleft lip and palate. Um, a long time ago, I've just celebrated my 60th birthday. Uh, last Happy week. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, I I did a, a, a whole range of things in my career. I was involved uh, initially um, with human rights. I worked for Amnesty International. I I did my studies in in Poland during martial law in the 1980s. So I I saw a lot of people who didn't really have a the ability to make themselves seen or heard. So I, I became, I suppose, politically aware in terms of people <clears throat> not being able to voice themselves freely. Um, uh, I worked in that arena for uh, quite some years. And then, then I started working for um, an organization that looked after people who, who were homeless. Um, again, um, <clears throat> a group of people that are often forgotten by society. They're not, not often seen, but they're there. Um, and then uh, a little while later, I, I saw there was an advert in a newspaper for um, a job as a first chief executive of, of a new organization called the Clef Lip and Palette Association in the UK, where I was living at the time. Um, and I thought, well, I probably know something about Clef Lip and Palette because I was born with a cleft. So I applied for the job and I, I got the job. Um, and it was a quite an interesting learning curve for me because most of the people I was working with in terms of support were actually parents uh, as opposed to me who was born with a cleft. So I actually had quite a different perspective on, um, on living with a cleft as opposed to being a parent. And I, I think that, that stayed with me in all the projects ever since and all the work I do. Um, I'm very keen to put forward the perspective of someone living with a cleft as opposed to someone who's a parent. And, and those are two different angles, but obviously they, they're part of the same family. Um, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I set up the European Cleft Organization. Um, whilst I was working in the UK with families with cleft and palate, I established connections with various other support bodies in Europe and also with health professionals. Um, and it became very aware to me that even within Europe, which is relatively small in terms of the world, um, there are such huge differences in um, the opportunities that people born with clefts have and, and, and the services available in terms of treatment. So I felt it was important to uh, have an organization that brought expertise together, shared knowledge, sure. east to west, um, north and south. I mean, we often talk about the, 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 the so-called poorer countries in Europe having poorer treatment. It's not always the case. You can go, you know, the differences between, say, Scandinavia and some parts of southern Europe are, are, are quite big as well in terms of health resources available. So um, I think working now for the last 10 years full time for the European Cleft Organization yeah. Um, I, I will I, ask about the uh, European Cleft Organization also. Okay. Uh, what's the purpose of your organization? What do you mainly focus on and what do you provide uh, to people living with clefts? Okay. The aim of the organization is to strive for 
equality of access to good cleft lip and palate care in Europe so that a family with a child in, in the UK will um, have the same knowledge, uh, treatment, um, care as a family, say, in Norway. And I mentioned those two countries because there was a survey many years ago that showed that the UK actually was quite um, behind in terms of cleft care. And we looked to other countries in Europe, for instance, Norway and, and Sweden for better care. So the aim of the organization is to bring together the expertise in countries that don't have uh, the resources and best care and share knowledge. And it's not always about money. It's actually about attitude. It's about working as a team. So you have not just one person, a surgeon or a orthodontist, but you have a whole team of people, including specialist nurses and psycho people supporting a lot of psychosocial perspective, psychologists. Um, uh, I suppose the, the core of our work is, is actually around um, the, family support, early nursing care support, um, psychosocial support for teenagers um, and, and indeed adults. So we, we fund programs that um, enable surgeons, for instance, to learn from each other, but our core work is probably around the, the more um, touchy-feely human aspects of living with a cleft, being a family and having a child with a cleft and actually having the resources, having the, um, the awareness of supporting a child in, in school environments, in social environments. So we're more of a sort of holistic approach, I think is, is where yeah. our, our drive is. Yeah, thank you. I know you have met many people living with clefts. Uh, and you have done so many projects. And what's your opinion uh, about the most challenging issues for people living with clefts? I mean, social exclusion or lack of esteem uh, or confidence. What do you think? It's it's a variety of things. I, I, I think e even if you have the best possible care and treatment, um, you will always be self-conscious of the way you look uh, and with cleft lip and palate, the way you speak as well, the way you sound. And I, I think that is underestimated. I, I've worked with a number of different craniofacial conditions, as you, as you know. And I think one of the unusual things for cleft is actually the speech. Um, and people do still focus on getting the perfect uh, face, the perfect um lack of scars and mouth and nose. But I actually think speech probably is, is very important. Um, if you are teased because of the way you look, you can probably explain the situation, why, how, and help people to understand. But if you're teased because of the way you speak, the moment you try to explain, then you are teased again because of the way you speak. Um, and I, I remember that from my own personal experience at school, um, which you know, you, is hard, but with, with the right supporting environment and um, with uh, a, a gradual way of learning coping skills, you, you just get through. Yeah. And how do you see the awareness uh, amongst the health professionals, educators and social workers? Uh, do you think, are they enough aware of these issues with uh, people with facial differences, in your opinion? Or we should promote more, we should uh, do more projects. What's your opinion? The, 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 the experts in the field, the people that, who are experiencing in treating craniofacial anomalies and cleft and palate, of course they have the knowledge and, and, and that's fine. The, the problems exist, I call them frontline health professionals, people, uh, general social workers or midwives when a child is born, um, um, doctors, GPs, um, people in society who, who, who are involved in healthcare, um, but they're the ones who often make the wrong judgments and decisions because they don't have the knowledge. So just using examples from my own work, um, 
we were doing a, a, a project in um, in Romania, and I was interviewing a parent in the north of Romania in Yash. Um, and there, there's actually a very good centre for cleft care in, in Yash. But um, his uh, social worker told the family that it's a very rare condition to have a child with a cleft. You'll have to go to Bucharest for treatment. So they had, they got on aeroplanes and they had lots of, you know, surgery takes a long time. And you're staying in different places and trying to support your family whilst your child is away, this kind of stuff. But actually what the social worker should have said is there's a very good center for treatment in the town we live in. So it's this lack of knowledge about what, what is available. The people who give the advice, the frontline people, the social workers, the general doctors, they should be made more aware of A, what the condition is about and B, the, the route map, the path to actually get treatment. And that time and time again, we have found people who have traveled to different countries to get the right treatment. Actually, it exists within 20 kilometers of where they live. Um, so, and that, that's a huge waste of resources for everyone. And going abroad certainly doesn't mean you'll get better treatment. Often it means you'll get worse treatment because you need the, um, the ongoing care from the same team so I, I it's in my mind obviously resources are important but it's it's more about communication it's more about frontline health professionals being aware of what this particular anomaly or health issue is about and having the knowledge of, of where to refer people on to and that that's the big thing it's saying it's the same i guess in in schools, uh, one of the projects you were talking about, the projects that we've been involved with at the European level, one of them is about um, supporting children through education. It's, yeah. We call it IHEM. Um, it's, it's available on, on the internet and we can obviously share the link after this. But um, the importance of making sure that teachers are aware that if there is a child with a cleft, they may they may, but not always, they may be falling behind. We don't know why. It could be because of hearing issues, could be because of self-esteem. Um, but the teacher needs to be aware that that child perhaps needs to be just watched that little bit closer to make sure they, they're keeping up with the rest. Um, I'm not talking here about you know, stigmatizing a child, but I'm saying let's just keep an a watchful eye over this person who has a child who has a cleft because we know from our studies that they do in general um, uh, need a little bit more support at certain stages of, of education and by and large educational attainment, attainment is, is good but um, there are various stages where if you have a, a cleft you need the teacher needs to be aware so things like that. so we, we develop packages for teachers and packages for health professionals and giving the health professionals permission via the parents to write to the teachers to say a child with a cleft you know just explaining so that the people are more aware yeah sure uh you have also done many a uh, good outputs also i know it's on the website you can also mention for example face value uh, resources they are very useful for everyone social workers educators or every society member uh, what were, were the effects of these outputs uh, I mean did you, could you uh, manage to change some perceptions in the society by doing these projects uh, it, it's, it's an extremely hard thing to measure um, yeah. when, when we've run the, you know, all these European projects they they result in, in online resources that people can use. Um, and obviously when we're developing the courses we do before and after, you, know, you measure people's knowledge before doing the course and you measure their knowledge afterwards. And, that's, and then if you can, you'll, you'll do it you know, six months later. Um, but to actually measure it over, right, what is, what is the difference over 10 years globally I, I don't know, um, but all we can do is, is chip away 
slowly um, and provide resources. So, so when people come to me now, um, you know, teachers or or someone with a child with a cleft who, who wants information for for their teachers, or if you've got um, a, a situation where a, a cleft team hasn't got the resources to um, have a psychologist or social worker on the team, we can at least give them the resources we have so that they can, in their small world, things will be better because they will have those online resources. And I think we've done the same with a, a nursing course as well. Most cleft teams around the world are not um, lucky enough to have resources to have a full team of nurse psychologists and everything but you can actually train other members of the team to look out for issues including speech actually a project we're working on at the moment <coughs> will be um, helping other team members and families to support issue, is, issues around speech um, so obviously having a uh, a full-time speech therapist is, is what you want. But if you can't do that, at least if you can support the parents or support other team members to look out for particular ways in which speech can be improved, then, then we're doing something. But the, have we changed the world? I don't know is the answer. We're, we're offering resources. Um, I, I think looking back, I, as I say, I've just... Um, had my 60th birthday I, I started working in this field professionally when um, I was in my 30s and um, certainly in terms of countries I've been involved with uh, the UK the whole system of cleft care is much bigger than it was 30 years ago in um, France uh, where I live now there's um, a centralization of services which is good for cleft care so instead of having a whole you know dozens of different centers you have a few expert centers um the idea of people learning from each other i think is getting better just again this is my feeling as opposed to science um there is an awareness now that you do need to have you, you need to listen to the people who give psychosocial support it's not just about surgery you need to listen to people who are supporting parents in the early weeks and months, so a lot of early nursing support as well. And I think you know, the, in the old days, surgeons were the king, and that was it, or the queen, or whatever. Um, whereas I, I'm sensing, certainly in Europe, there, there is um, a feeling that there's much more to, um, much more to making sure young people and adults thrive than yeah. just one aspect of medical treatment. It's about a whole picture. Yeah, but uh, I think we are lucky now nowadays because of the social media or other uh, broadcasts uh, will make enable to people to be more aware maybe. Uh, and for last question, uh, I would like to talk about the face equality. Uh, what face equality means to you? Uh, I know uh, you are very experienced in European Union and also on other organizations. In your opinion, uh, should face equality uh, be involved in United Nations agenda? I I think it all Because comes. It's a very neglected uh, human rights issue, so okay. we should uh, work hard. Uh, to be more uh, popular in every field, I think. I, I think it needs to be raised to um, <coughs> an international level. I, I think um, working with United Nations, a World Health Organization, yeah. will, will make facial difference and facial equality more visible. And I think if As with anything, the reason, just a, a simple example, and we, we, we've seen quotes during Face Awareness Week of, of people looking different, going for an interview, and they know the moment they walk into the room, the interview's over because they, they look different. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I think 
the, the, the way to actually make that change is for the visible difference to become more visible. So if it's, if it's, if it's seen um, to be more in the media, more in the news, more in the you know, United Nations, World Health Organization, if it becomes common, it's no longer scary. Um, I mean, the, it's worked with other, other um, societal um, um, prejudices as well. I mean, we, th th there's many areas where as soon as something becomes spoken about and becomes normalized, it's no longer scary. You know, I think yeah. the, the, the hard thing, you know, if, if, if you are faced with someone who, who does look very different to you, actually it's probably um because you're curious you're, you're going to be oh what's what's happened to them i mean it's it's what we do as as human beings um so i think if we can help the the people who are looking at someone who is uh visibly different help them understand what the challenges are then they won't be so curious and when you take away the barrier of, of difference and curiousness then we, we're getting nearer equality yeah yeah so Gerrit uh, thank you for your thoughts uh, it was very kind to talk to you and I was very proud to meet you again uh, it was a really nice conversation uh, thank you for your uh, giving time to us and have a good uh, day and stay safe uh, And, and, and to you, good to speak to you and um, keep, keep up the really good work you're doing at Happy Faces.